All right, so finishing up chapter 26, patient assessment with the reassessment portion. Obviously, we're going to do everything that we do for everybody else, except for when we're talking about burns in particular. You want to make sure that the burning process has, in fact, stopped. Um, we're really going to be very cognizant of how they're breathing. We want to support circulation because somebody that has um, come in contact with burns, they tend to get very dehydrated and hypovolemic very fast, even if they're not bleeding. And then oxygen. We want to definitely uh, keep our patient as perfused as possible. And then communicate and document um, everything that we're finding on our assessment in as much detail as is necessary. Emergency care uh, for burns kind of depends on what the burn is. First and foremost, we need to stop the burning process. And there's a couple of uh, different steps in skill drill 26-2 that will kind of help walk you through these. But the first type of burn is thermal burns caused by heat that's applied to the uh, body. Most commonly, they're caused by scalds or super hot water or an open flame itself. Um, the flame burn is often deep, especially if a patient's clothes catch fire. Um, scalding burns are more seen in kids or handicapped adults um, or something to do with cooking. Hot liquids are what produce scald injuries. They're often over a large surface of the body um, because those liquids can spread very, very quickly. Um, Coming in contact with hot objects ends up producing a contact burn. Um, they're rarely like super deep because oftentimes you touch and you pull away. Um, so unless there was something that prevented the patient from moving away from that. A steam burn, um, this is very similar to a scald except it's um, from air vapors that have been heated rather than from actually coming um, in contact with um, the water itself or liquid itself. And then a flash burn is produced by an explosion, which can very, very briefly expose a person to very, very intense heat. Um, lightning strikes also are a type of flash burn. So management, stop the process, cool the burned area, remove jewelry. So there's a huge potential for swelling with burns. And so we want to get all of their jewelry off while we still can get it off of them. So we don't end up having to cut it off. We want to maintain a high index of suspicion for inhalation injuries. Um, the larger the burn, the more likely the patient will end up developing hypothermia and or hypovolemia. And then all patients with large surface burns should have a dry, sterile dressing applied to help them out. Um, a lot of people think kind of in the back of their mind, I want to wet this down to cool them down. Well, unfortunately, their body is not retaining any heat. So all you're going to do is make them hypothermic by putting on wet. Now to get them started um, so that you can actually chill out that burning process and stop the burning process, yes, you may need to use some cool water. But once you get that stopped, now we're doing dry dressings and we don't put any sort of salve or anything like that on the dressing. Just dry, sterile dressing is more than adequate. Inhalation burns, this is typically when you are exposed to burning in a small place and you end up inhaling super heated um, air or steam. And you can have very rapid, very serious um, airway compromise if this were to happen. Uh, upper damage, upper airway damage is often associated with inhalation of superheated gases. Lower is more with inhalation of chemicals and then particulate matter that you can be exposed to during a fire. When treating a patient for inhalation injuries, we you may end up encountering a patient that has significant airway swelling 
which is going to be something that you can't adequately manage as a BLS truck. So you may need to get ALS rolling if your patient has strider or that high pitched sound um, as they breathe, hoarse voice, singed nasal hairs, burns of the face, and then that carbony soot anywhere within the airway, often seen in the nose or around the mouth. Um, you want to go ahead and apply cool mist, aerosol therapy, or humidified oxygen to help reduce some of that edema, if that's possible. Apply an ice pack to the throat to reduce swelling. Um, then make sure that you're aware that your patient now may have been um, exposed to toxic gases on top of everything else. Um, the less efficient the burning process, the more toxic gases may be created from that. The biggest one that we worry about is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide inhalation should be considered whenever a group of people in the same place report a headache or nausea. Cherry red skin is kind of one of those things that they always tell us to look for, but that's such a late sign. Often people that have been exposed to CO don't get that massive cherry red skin, but it can happen. Their lips, nail beds are also um, reddish in a tint as well, but don't rule out any sort of carbon monoxide um, exposure just because they're not red. Another one is hydrogen cyanide. So this is generated by combustion as well. Signs and symptoms involve the central nervous system, respiratory system, and cardiovascular, leading to like faintness, anxiety, abnormal vital signs, headaches, seizures, paralysis, and coma. For management, um, first and foremost, the safety of you and your crew. Pre-hospital for somebody with um, suspected hydrogen cyanide poisoning involves decontamination and there is an antidote but you guys won't carry it on, on a BLS truck oftentimes you'll have to get an ALS provider there and then recognizing any sort of um, toxic gas exposure trying to identify what that they were exposed to and then of course in, um, starting with supportive treatment chemical burns occur whenever a top toxic substance contacts the body most are caused by either strong acids or strong alkalis, so they're on the opposite end of the spectrum there. Your eyes are particularly vulnerable to chemical burns, and the severity of the burn is directly related to three main factors. What was the chemical, what was the concentration, and how long were you exposed to it? To prevent exposure to hazardous materials, we need to make sure that we can safely um, approach the patient. Sometimes we actually have to wait for the hazmat team to show up and decontaminate the patient, but either way, wear some uh, appropriate PPE, chemical resistant gloves, eye protection at the very least. Um, and most of the time your treatment is going to be specific to whatever they are um, exposed to. So, um, First, remove the chemical from the patient, uh, if at all possible. Brush off the dry chemicals um, off skin and clothing before flushing the patient with water. After you remove their clothing, take care not to come in contact with the chemical itself. For a liquid chemical, um, immediately flush the burned area with large amounts of otter, water and then just continue going. Um, there's no really minimum amount of time that we should be irrigating chemical burned areas. So continue flooding it for 15 to 20 minutes, um, even after the patient says, no, hey, it feels so much better. Um, patient's eyes, we're going to flush like crazy. Um, but we want to make sure that we decontaminate um, the patient before we transport them in. For electrical burns, this may be because you've come in contact with either high or low voltage energy and whichever you've come in contact with is going to determine the injury pattern. High voltage, um, this is more likely with like utility workers that come in direct contact with power lines, but um, the ordinary low voltage electricity that can be found in your house 
um, can also cause severe burns and cardiac arrhythmias. For electricity to actually flow, there has to be a couple of different things um, that allow it to go. There has to be a circuit between whatever the electrical source is and the ground. Um, there's a couple of different terms. The insulator is any substance that prevents the circuit from being created. A conductor is anything that allows a current to actually flow through it. The human body itself is a very good conductor. And um, so electrical burns are going to occur when the body or some sort of part of it ends up completing a circuit from a power source to the ground. The type of current, magnitude of the current, and voltage are all going to have an effect on how bad the burn is. It is completely irrelevant until we ensure our safety first. Um, if we end up touching a patient that's touching a power line because the body's a good conductor, now all of a sudden we're down too. Um, you can fatally uh, be injured by touching that patient. So just don't do it. A burn injury appears where the electricity has entered the body and then where it exits, but it can cause a different injury along the path as well. Um, there may be a large amount of deep tissue injury that you can't see because the electricity is bounced around in the body rather than being visible. Um, your patient may or may not go into cardiac or respiratory arrest. If the patient's not in cardiac arrest when you get there, it's very unlikely that they will progress that direction. Here's a lovely look at an electrical burn here. For management, um, if the patient is in cardiac arrest, go ahead and start CPR, prepare to defibrillate if necessary, oxygen, treat the soft tissue injury by that um, straw, applying that dry sterile dressing and then provide prompt transport. Taser injuries um, is definitely something we're seeing more and more because the use of tasers has become more uh, likely. This used to be the fireable tasers where it actually had two small darts or called electrodes that would actually penetrate the patient's skin. There was barbs on that to keep it from coming back out. And then they would actually go ahead and shock through that. Depending on the local protocol, ALS workers may be able to pull them out. Uh, EMTs might be able to pull them out or it may have to go into the, doc the hospital and have a doctor actually pull them out. Um, there's a couple of conditions in which the devices have been used and end up making things way worse for the patient. Um, excited delirium we talked about may actually cause a patient to go into a sudden cardiac arrest or dysrhythmias because of this. So whenever we respond to somebody that's been tased, we need to have an AED with us. Radiation burns, there's not a whole lot we're gonna do about it. Um, oftentimes we don't even realize that it's there until well after everybody's been exposed. But this, um, more refers to like transportation of radioactive isotopes. So we have some idea that they're there, but biggest thing, determine if there's been a radiation exposure and attempt to determine whether it's ongoing or it, has it been contained. There's three different types of ionizing radi radiation. Alpha particles have very little penetrating injury. They're easily stopped by the skin. Beta have greater penetrating power. They can travel much further in the air than alpha, alpha particles. They can penetrate the skin, but pretty much clothing can block those. And then gamma is the biggest threat. The type of radiation is very penetrating, very easily passes through the body. Most ionizing radiation accidents involve gamma radiation, which is your x-rays. Uh, people who have sustained radiation generally don't pose a risk to others, but it can be if they were in an explosion. Management, maintain your safe distance, um, call for people that are going to be able to help. Uh, most contaminants can be removed by simply removing the patient's uh, clothing. Call for other resources, irrigate your open wounds, notify your emergency department, try and identify the radioactive source if possible, um, and then limit you and the patient's exposure to it and try and keep some sort of shielding between yourself and any sort of gamma radiation. And this is the rest that I have for chapter 26.